All right. Um, thank you very much for being able to present here. Uh, my name is Tom. I'm from a company in Amsterdam called Geodon. Uh, <coughs> we're mainly working as, um, let's say, intermediate to end users from PostGIS, uh, which means we're in implementing the solutions for governmental organizations, um, smaller companies, to, to put their data into their, their spatial data into a database and usually um, uh, either a web map or, or some other routing um, solutions. Um, for the last couple of months we've been experimenting with point cloud data um, because um, Netherlands is one of the countries that is the first to, uh, to deliver uh, the whole nation uh, in, in point clouds uh, as open data which gives a big opportunity to, um, to play with it. And today what I want to explain to you is how we used um, a combination of uh, 2D data, 2D vector data, which is the, the, the cadastral data, uh, which we also have nationwide to combine it with point cloud data to create three-dimensional models. Okay, first out, well, luckily, uh, <laughs> thanks to the previous speaker, I can skip this part. I'm very happy with that because I wasn't, uh, I, I, I couldn't fit that into one minute. Um, yeah. So then I'll, I'll tell you the Dutch situation, what we're dealing with, some of our experiences, um, three use cases we got out of that. Um, use cases are a bit the holy grail for us at the moment. We're really looking into how can we make these point clouds into, into good use for our customers. And uh, we might finish with some discussion points. Um, now this I can go through pretty quickly, I think. Um, interesting question. I'm not sure whether I should categorize it more like raster data or more like vector data point clouds. I'm, I tend to see it more like raster data. Then again, many, many calculations you do on it are typically for vector data. Um, oh yeah, it, it can be ranging from very small to a whole country. Um, it started as um, actually an in industry as making um, making scans from um, uh, from smaller objects from machinery, uh, but now you can just attach it under a plane and fly the whole country. This image is familiar, I think. Um, and of course, at the moment they're putting it into every self-driving car. Um, <coughs> so what we can expect is, uh, is is tons and tons of data coming from all the sensors driving around the the roads. Um, now the Dutch situation. Uh, what you see here are actually points. Um, very famously uh, H and 2 viewer it's called. You can access it online. You can, uh, uh, you can play around, uh, uh, zoom in on the whole country, uh, see up to a building level. Um, it is maintained every eight years. They're continuously <coughs> flying um, an airplane in, uh, in winter times to, uh, to scan the, the country and every eight years it's, it's refreshed with a minimum of about eight, usually more points per square meters. It's already classified when we get it, it means the ground uh, points are separated from other objects like trees and houses. Most importantly it's open data, everybody can access it. Now this gives a bit the, the idea of the situation. We have, uh, we have extensive <coughs> areas with uh, very similar buildings. Um, this is the typically suburban area around Amsterdam. And uh, what you see is actually points and you see very obviously the roofs, the trees, uh, some terrain. But what you can also see is there's some gaps in it. Some, some of the, the houses have a gap where the plane just flew from the other direction and wasn't able to touch that, uh, the frontal part, the facade of the building. Um, the classification, interestingly enough, we have, uh, you see, Blue is, is trees, obviously, uh, light green, the buildings, and the red part is bridges. So we have bridges separated in the point cloud data. Um, for us, interesting, because we have um, sets with an interval of about eight years in point cloud data to compare them. So our idea was uh, we want to put all the data we have from 2010 and 2016 and put that on top of each other, see what happens. Here's an example. Uh, two things that are obvious is that you see that the old house is in blue and the new house is in yellow. Uh, you see they put a roof, an extra floor on the building. Uh, another thing, you see cars, uh, old uh, situation in blue, new situation in white, they change the direction of the parking lots in the area. Um, now th this might seem trivial, but it's nice if you have it for the whole country because you can do some statistics on it. Um, 
so we had a bright, brilliant idea. Why not put all this, uh, this data into, uh, into Postgres? Uh, at that time, the, the PG Point Cloud extension uh, was delivered. Uh, so we started playing with it. Um, we were, in the beginning, very positive on doing that. We just thought, oh, I would do it in some, uh, some two or three days' work. We'll put some, uh, some in the database. In the end, it turned out to be a work of weeks before we had it in the database. <laughs> Um, this one I can safely skip because um, this is the current situation. Uh, this is the coverage we have for the, for the latest version. Every um, orange triangle you see is one file. Uh, these are rather big areas. It's uh, up to three gigabytes of point cloud in LAS, so that means zipped. Uh, those are big files. We have a total of about 413 gigabytes um, of those files. Um, and if you put them into your database, they'll grow roughly four times bigger with the help of dimensional compression. I'm very curious to see what happens if we start using the last compression. Yeah. So that, that uses a total of six terabytes of disk, disk space, um, which was when we started um, a year ago, uh, still really a lot, but it's going very fast. Uh, terabytes is, uh, seems to be starting the norm. Um, and this hurt a bit. It took weeks of loading time. Um, actually, more than weeks. It took months of loading time. Um, and that was shocking, <laughs> because if you start uh, uh, having these sets coming in continuously, <laughs> then we, you just can't um, keep up with uh, the speed of new sets coming in. Um, uh, up to now, we didn't find a solution for that. Now, how do we deal with this? Uh, we have six terabytes of SSDs uh, in the server. Um, this is at the moment relatively expensive. We believe in the next two years this will drop significantly with the, the, the new versions of SSDs. <coughs> uh, so we don't see there's a problem of using SSDs for it. Uh, as you just heard, the PDL pipeline is being used to, to put it in, uh, using the chipper to put in the blocks of 400 points per, per patch. Um, that takes a lot of time. This, this chipping process takes very long. Uh, reading a last file of three gigabytes takes a long time and then putting it all in one stream into um, uh, point clouds, in a PG point clouds, also takes a long time. And uh, what was more uh, difficult is it explodes it all into memory, which means you need at least 100 gigabytes of memory. Uh, we bought a new server for that. Uh, so this is not new for you. Um, yeah, very important point we figured out. Put every last file in its own table. Don't start to combine last files into one big table um, because in the end, if you make a mistake, um, <coughs> there's not really much turning back in, uh, uh, in fixing your table again. Um, ah, yeah. Uh, we thought to be clever in the beginning. Um, we thought, well, we have a, a machine with eight processes on it, so uh, we're going to just load them uh, in eight parallel processes. Um, so we first cut these three gigabytes files with lost tools into smaller files, which goes relatively quickly, and then just start pushing this data into into the database on, on six different threads. That was a bad idea. Why was it a bad idea? Because it turns out that your point clouds get rather separated over disk. Every process takes a different piece of the country, um, uh, but since they're writing parallel, all those different pieces come together on the disk, whereas they have nothing to do with each other. Um, thanks to Giuseppe for pointing this out, it took us, uh, we didn't even see it, we only noticed it was a bit slow. Uh, in the end, um, uh, we got to it that when we started using the BRIN index, um, uh, it was, it became obvious that this, uh, this data really should be close to each other on the disk. Um, so yeah, that's the other one. Um, we really did put all six billion records in one table the first time. That was a very bad idea. Um, uh, so we learned from that. Um, some of the nice surprises we got in the end. Um, uh, indexing, we were really afraid that it would take considerable time. Um, but it was not that bad, um, uh, especially not if you compare it to weeks of loading time. Uh, but still, the indexing is within minutes uh, of, of, of one last file, which is uh, very acceptable to us. Uh, they're effective. Um, it, the, the combination of, of 400 points per patch and indexing your patches really gives good results to us. Um, and filtering, um, 
uh, I, I missed that a bit in the previous talk, but there's also a function where you can filter your patch, which means give me all the points in this patch that have a Z value above two, for instance, um, which is very important when you start start working with your um, uh, uh, your calculation and your statistics on it. And we were very happy to find some new SF Seagull functions to work with because in the end, um, or the whole point was to make 3D models out of the, uh, the point cloud data. Now, point cloud in itself is not a 3D model, it's just points. And um, we can see that a point builds a house, but uh, the computer has no idea whether the point is part of a house or it's part of the, the tree. Um, there is a hidden feature in SF Seagull. It took us a while before we found it, but you can do triangulation. Um, that saves us a lot of work because before this we were using Delaunay tri triangulation from Geos library, uh, which is not that fast and not that um, accurate. Um, so we started using our um, 2D data sets we have together with the point cloud data set. Um, now what you see on the left picture uh, is a not a very pretty image of a uh, cadastral data set. Gray is roads, uh, green is um, patches of green grass, usually. Um, uh, blue is water, and there is a little bit of relief in this area. Netherlands hasn't got mountains or anything that looks like it, but we still do have relief dikes. And our point was we wanted to get these small things in the relief, we wanted to get them into the model. So you get this kind of result in the end. Uh, so you go from flat surface to some triangulated terrain area. And on top of that, we want to have buildings, of course. Now, I'll take you to the process of how we started doing that. Um, this is, um, I left some black notes for myself on the sheet. <laughs> Um, this is uh, an, a, a hill, small hill in the, in the town where I live. Uh, I wanted to, to get that hill into three dimensions. And uh, as you can see, it, it is the, the, the cluster data is pretty detailed. You see little footpaths going up that hill. There's a little castle on the left where you see the wall. Um, and you see one patch exactly in the middle with the, the black line around it, this patch, um, that I'm going to take an example on how we made that into a 3D model. Um, now, what you first do, um, you find the patches that uh, intersect with your polygon, of course. Um, that goes very fast. Um, next, what you do, you have about 600 points per patch, in our case. Uh, you start getting the points from these patches. Now, what you see here is um, a random subset. This is only 5% of the, the content, otherwise you would only see black dots. Um, but the next step is that the, the most time consuming for us, you have to, because the, the 2D cadaster data we have has no information for its vertices on, on how, uh, how high, what the Z value is for a vertex. So we have to translate the Z values from the point cloud data into the nearest vertice of um, uh, the polygon you see. So that is the nearest neighbor search. Uh, so what we're doing for every vertex in the polygon, we do a nearest neighbor search on the uh, point cloud data. If you have that in the end, um, the only thing you have to do is combine your point cloud points and combine your vertices and the lines into a triangulation function and this is the result. So you get a nicely triangulated polygon. Now rinse and repeat this process you do for every polygon you have in your database. Um, we were really afraid for that. We thought that is undoable. Um, in the end, results not that bad, which I'm going to show you. Um, yeah, I, uh, I could go more into detail. I was playing with first, but luckily in the next talk you'll see a bit more on this. Um, to give you an idea on what this takes in a query, um, this is very quickly what one query looks like just to get this piece <laughs> of patch. Uh, on purpose I left it in a bit of a messy state, but you can get the feeling of what we're dealing with. Um, it's fun. It's really fun to, to make these kind of queries. Um, at the same time, uh, um, after having 10 of these queries, because you need one query for the green parts, one for the buildings, one for the water, they're all different. It tends to get a bit messy sometimes. Um, uh, but we've got them online. You can uh, check them on GitHub uh, to see how we've been doing it. Um, now, what did we make out of this? I have no idea how fast I'm going, whether I'm really speeding or... Oh, that's rather safe. 
And now I pray that my internet connection is still working. I see an orange, no, it works. Though I still see an orange triangle in my You don't see anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, there it goes. But it's still a big white surface. I'm afraid the, the internet connection left me. <coughs> it is truly a pity. Uh, my mouth, oh no. Any of you is downloading movies at the moment? Here we go. Um, now, the speed you'll start seeing now is roughly the speed it takes the server to build up this area. Uh, what you actually see is going from point clouds and so there's this long query with point clouds and um, 2D data putting into one 3D model. Um, <coughs> as you can see, it's done patch by patch. There's patches of about 100 by 100 meters. Um, every 100 by 100 meters is uh, roughly, well you can see the, the amount of layers on the left, that amount of layers, and then times the number of queries. Uh, so the CPUs are getting warm at the moment, at the server. Um, but you start seeing buildings, you see some, some <coughs> if I would have mouse, some water over here. Uh, and what is nice is that the, um, the trees are still, or the buildings are still seen as one object. So we go from point cloud, which is just a homogeneous um, bunch of data, into objects which have really a, a third dimension. Um, now, this viewer, what is nice about it is that uh, PostGIS has a function of exporting as X3D. Uh, this viewer does X3D. Um, it is a very small step to go from the output from PostGIS X3D to this view in the web browser. You will be surprised if you try it. Um, so what you see is direct output from the, uh, from the Postgres database. And some nice things you can play with now is uh, you can start uh, moving the, the light direction. Now this, of course, is only for the demo effect. The real use case would be something with flop models or, <coughs> or seeing how much, uh, how much shade you have in your garden if you would buy a new house. Um, now, about these use cases, which are the, 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 the big thing for us, because in the end we have to, to find, uh, to put it to use, we have to make some money with it. Um, up to now we were not able, but I'm, I'm sure I see a bright future. Um, uh, you can do something with, uh, with vegetation in it, I think. Um, and there's a, a very nice function in the, the new version of PostGIS, uh, which is cluster DB scan. Uh, first, what you see here in the, in the red lines is you're taking uh, um, the, the points where you are sure it is vegetation, which means it has a, a, a pretty low intensity and it has um, um, a double return numbers, which means the, uh, the laser went through the vegetation. And the next step is you start clustering it. Uh, this is a very simple example where you say, well, over an area with two and a half meter diameters, I want at least 370 points a density, which means I probably have a tree. Um, and um, that would separate one tree from the other if they're not too close together. Um, now, here's an intermediate result. What you see is trees from two different times. It's just the center of Amsterdam. Um, red is 2000, green is 2009 probably. And what you see, the trees have grown over time. In the front here, I have been planting new trees. We check it up on, on Street View, you can obviously see it. And the trees have been growing quite a lot. Older trees don't really grow. And in the back you have seen, you can see trees which have actually been cut, they've been removed. Now this is interesting because if as a municipality you need to know what um, your vegetation is doing, uh, or whether you need to maintain your trees, or branches are hanging too low over the road, you have to cut them, you can actually ask your point cloud data to do it. Um, and the very nice thing is here that you can connect because the municipality of Amsterdam knows exactly which tree is standing where. They can already assign a value to this tree. They know oh, this is a birch tree and it's planted in uh, 19 something. Um, and so you can then combine your homogeneous point cloud data to actual objects. 
um, which is very valuable, I think. Here's an example of a map we made from the, the top you see now. Trees which have grown are, are green, trees are shrinking or, or not growing anymore are red. Um, so this gives an idea of how your area is doing. Um, and all with the help of just point clouds, which is relatively cheap data. Um, how's my time doing, by the way? I'm not horribly over time. Seven minutes. That includes the questions? <laughs> okay, then one last more. Um, one fun example we had, um, we thought about we would make, um, uh, who has kids who play Minecraft? That little. In the Netherlands, Minecraft is a big thing. Every kid plays Minecraft. Um, so we were asked to make a, a Minecraft level uh, consisting of the whole country. Um, so we do have Minecraft for the Netherlands. You can just walk around, you can go to the server and you can walk around the whole country in Minecraft. I thought, <laughs> my first idea was, this is a horribly bad idea. Who wants to look at one country in one blocks of one by one square meter? Um, also, I, I, I just, I, I didn't fancy Minecraft at that moment. And especially if you look in the intermediate results, this is what happened when we uh, merged the point cloud data with the Minecraft blocks. So what you see now is blocks of one by one by one square meter. It doesn't look very pretty, but you can see there's roads, there's houses, some water maybe in the back. You can see chimneys, towers. And we asked school kids to work with this and they could do whatever they like. This was just the base for them to work on. So they can find their own house, they can find a church, they can find the shopping area. Uh, and they were free to do whatever they liked with it. Apart from the fact that kids can do horrible things with um, being creative. Uh, I will not give the examples about that, but. We had a lot of folly in the area as well. Um, this is what they came up with, which is, I think is, is really amazing. Uh, you can still see the old buildings in the, in, in the far corner there. Uh, so we went from, from rough point clouds of the whole country to this kind of situation of the whole country. And I think that's very powerful. Not that we have any revenues from it, but uh, as a demonstration, it, it looks very nice. And with that, I think I'd like to, to conclude my talk. And, uh, and there might even be time for some questions. <laughs> if there's no questions, I have some discussion points myself. Uh. <laughs>